Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Sherrard Show. I'm your host, Sherrard. I hope you're having a wonderful Saturday afternoon. I am having a great one because we have a very exciting, wonderful show, ladies and gentlemen. We have a boxing superstar as well as a champion on the show. I just decided to spend part of his evening with the Sherrard Show, Mr. Austin Trout. We're so glad to have him on the show on our segment entitled today, don't count me out, ladies and gentlemen. And this segment is brought to you by Essence Television. Essence Television, this is the new network for the Sherrard Show. You can see all of the biggest interviews from the Ashley Brothers to the Manhattans to Austin Trout, as well as Floyd Mayweather, as well as Mike Tyson on the show. Just go to Essence Television. It's on your screen, ladies and gentlemen. And then also you can go and uh, watch, if you missed the episodes of the Sherrard Show, you can also view it or listen to it on iHeartRadio. Just type in iHeartRadio, the Sherrard Show, and while you're driving or working out, you can hear the best interviews of your life, ladies and gentlemen, on iHeartRadio. Now on to the show, ladies and gentlemen. This man has been um, a boxer for many years. Actually, he is a champion. He's a champion who's fought some of the best fighters, such as Canelo Alvarez, Miguel Cotto, you name it, he's done it, and he's held his own. And he stopped by the Sherrard Show to talk about his career, as well as something very interesting that you did not know that he's going to share today, as well, part of his wonderful beliefs. Mr. Austin Trout, how are you this evening, sir? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. It's definitely an honor to be here. Likewise, sir. Likewise, let's jump right into it. Now, Austin, um, being a fighter for many years, um, you you model yourself, and I've seen your style. Um, you have a little Floyd, you have a little Muhammad Ali. You can really get down out there, but not too many people have achieved what you've achieved uh, being a boxer. How were you able to do it for so many years? You know, um, one a faith belief. Um, I tell everybody, you got to, you know, you got to start with some sort of belief, um, definitely belief in yourself, uh, belief in a higher power, uh, whatever it is, you, your faith has got to be the the basis or the foundation of all of it. Because, um, you know, if you don't believe in something, then there's really no point in working towards it or going through any of the hardships that it will take to achieve any greatness, you know. So, uh, you know, I, I always believed that I was meant to do something big in the boxing game uh we're really just big period but you know I, I felt like boxing was the the vehicle I chose to do something great now Austin what age did that hit you because you know being as great as you are in the boxing world um and I'm sure in life period but most fighters have started off you're talking about four or five years old picking up gloves like Floyd Mayweather is that what happened to you as well um I started when I was about 10 years old so you know not as young as some fighters, but definitely still young enough to say that I've been doing this all my life. Um, and you like they say, you can't play boxing for you have to live it. And, you know, I found that out as a kid, you know, I was you know not able to eat or drink sodas and, and candy like most kids. And, and, you know, the times that I took off, that's, that's really when I was eating the most junk and, and living the worst. So boxing made me live, you know, the straight and narrow, so to speak. You know, um, you fought some of the best. I mean, you know, when you wake up, what is it like when you um know the next day you're gonna have to face Mikhail Cotto? What is that like? I mean, seriously. It was it was, well, at the time. It was such an exciting feeling. It was my break. It was my chance to show the world, you know, especially the boxing world, who I am, who I was. And you know, at the time, I was an undefeated world champion, but nobody knew or cared. So I, I was very, man, when I got that call, I remember, you know, I was living in this little, you know, shack of a house and uh, I just went outside and just started screaming like, yo, they slept on me and now I'm gonna put this boy to sleep. You know? And, 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 you know, that is interesting because you, if my, if, if my uh, facts serve me right, you gave Miguel Cotto his first loss, is that correct? First loss in the Madison Square Garden. Wow, now- He never just, lost in New York. Yeah. You talk about Madison Square Garden. They don't often hold fights, but when the atmosphere there is as big as Vegas, is that correct? That's right. You know, Miguel, I think, excuse me, is one of the last um, fights that they had there, if I'm not mistaken. And I believe Okoto was probably one of the last fights they had there. 
And and now, ladies, for those and ladies and gentlemen, for those who are not too familiar with boxing, uh, Miguel Cotto is a Puerto Rican boxer that can lay a beating on you. I mean, he's always on you. He's always on you. He doesn't give you any rest. And to for this gentleman, Austin Trout, to be able to do quite commendable because Floyd himself said that Miguel was his toughest opponent he ever fought. Well, you know, right after Miguel Cotto gave Floyd Mayweather one of his toughest fights. I was the fight right after that. And people were looking at me as like just a, a come up fight, uh, a stay busy fight or a tune up, so to speak. And I kept telling everybody, I said, look, I'm going to beat Cotto worse than Floyd did. And arguably I did. I beat Cotto worse than Floyd and Canelo did, actually. Yeah, because uh, right, that is true. Now, tell me this. What did you do? What did you see in Cotto to help you to be able, when he was fighting Floyd, to be able to... Um, see something that was going to allow you to beat him worse? Well, me being left-handed, uh, I felt that surprisingly my jab was going to control the fight. Uh, I, I saw that he needed to to kind of get in and get set to let his work happen. And so I just, with my jab, I kept him offset the whole fight. Wow, that is amazing um, <laughs> to be able to do that and then to go on to even bigger, better and things. Now, um, this is interesting as well, and I'm sure you'll know this, um, when I was growing up, because I've been a boxing enthusiast, enthusiast since Muhammad Ali days, so on and so forth. But when I was growing up, the heavyweight division was the focal point in boxing. But now because of you, Floyd and Miguel and people like that, now the welterweight, the light middleweight, uh, uh, lightweight, those lesser divisions are the focal point now. Um, what do you think to contribute to that as well? I honestly, I feel like, uh, you know, if, if you're over six foot and over 200 pounds and have some athleticism, then you're going to go play football or basketball. So, so we end up losing a lot of our heavyweights, you know, to, to the more popular American sports, such as, and the more, more the collegiate and school sports like football and basketball. Uh, and, and that, I feel like, you know, little guys like us who weren't playing football and basketball, we were able to segue into boxing. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, not just that, with that, with that said, the heavyweight division is making a, a one heck of a comeback. We got Deontay Wilder, we got Tyson Fury, Anthony Joshua, Luis Ortiz, uh, and that's just to name a few, and and, and plenty of, of Dylan White, Bovekin, uh, who Joshua just you know plenty of of uh, names and interesting matchups that that can be made. So. And, if you look at the history of it, when the heavyweight division is doing good, all of boxing is doing good. I mean, it's been an honor, don't get me wrong, to be in the weight classes that's kind of carrying boxing. Um, but if we all want to get into that, that big money, the heavyweights need to come back. <laughs> that is true. That is absolutely true. Now, um, Austin, when you categorize, or when people categorize you, or when you feel, you know, they give you comparisons, would it be a fair comparison to say you, uh, your style is like a Sugar Ray Leonard, Floyd Patterson kind of style? Honestly, um, I, because, you know, I, I, I'm more of a, an adaptable guy. I, I just have to fight how I have to fight, compared, you know, determine on who I'm fighting. Um, so, I don't know who I can say I'm really compared to, but I am very smart. So I would like to say I got a little bit of Bernard Hopkins in me. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I can uh -huh. analyze and, and, and break down, so to speak. You know, it's funny because Bernard Hopkins is a great, great fighter. Um, he doesn't really, I, don't, I don't think he gets enough credit because uh, he's, a tough, he's a tough blue collar Philly guy. That really yeah, no, I, don't think, yeah, I think give it a little while and you know I pray before I pray that the boxing world lets him know how special he is before he passes. You know, it cool. seems that you have to die before you become special. You know, um it's funny, Austin, because I'm a left-handed person too. So I'm kind of yeah, just listening to you. Um, and I'm smiling because we think alike because you were saying, you know, as your boxer that adopt, adapts, that's how I am in life. You know, you kind of feed off of what people's throwing your way and you can adapt to it. So that's quite impressive. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are speaking to a boxing superstar, Austin Trout. Um, he's a champion, a world champion, and he's been around many years and he's got some big fights coming up and he's had some big fights. And if you look at that million dollar smile, it looked like he hadn't got hit once. 
ladies and gentlemen. Man, man. Man, I, I try to keep my, you know, my my faces. <laughs> Hopefully he can make me money one day. I love I love to act or do something in t- television, if possible. I mean we now, can all dream, right? Yeah. Right? <laughs> now Austin, um, after your fights, um, when you uh, had defeated Miguel Cotto, and where did your life go from there? Did it take off? Did all of the big fights come after that? I, you know, actually it did. Uh, you know, I ended up getting my next fight was against Canelo, and then my, the fight after that was against Laura. Um, then I came back on like a you know a four fight win streak and I ended up getting, you know, plenty of good title shots and I had some really good fights. I fought both Charlo brothers, Heard, uh, you know, really you name it, I, I fought them, uh, you know, except for the the great Floyd Mayweather. So now, it, it definitely uh, it, it propelled me to get these big fights. And you know, really, I'm just here trying to recapture some of that more those, that those glory moments. Mm-hmm. Now, um. What was your most difficult fight, would you say? Um, you just mentioned the Charlo brothers, Canelo. Um, you fought a lot. Miguel Cotto, as you yeah. mentioned. Who would you say was your toughest opponent? Honestly, Eris Landy Lara, hands down. You know, uh, physically, he didn't beat me up like, well, you know, I feel like I, I haven't heard. He, physically, it was more of a, a rough fight for me. But Lara, he mentally beat me. I couldn't figure out what to do and, and that's probably been the longest 12 rounds I ever experienced. Now, when you say he mentally beat you, you're saying before the fight he had you or? No, no, he just, he, his timing and, and his, his craftiness inside the ring. You know, everything I tried, I would get countered with something. You know, everything I would try and end up having to push the issue, push the fight more. And it just got, you know, I just kind of felt like I was slipping into a hole of, of, that I couldn't get out of. Mm-hmm. And, and really, it was it was just it was nothing uh, he did outside the ring. It was everything that he did inside the ring. Mm-hmm. Now, was he a southpaw or was he a? <laughs> yeah, he was a southpaw too. Oh wow, yeah, you know that's it, it's funny being left-handed. You when the you one, see a left-handed, it looks awkward. Lefties. It's awkward, right? It I'm used awkward. to looking at all the righties. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> it's interesting. So it's very awkward. Um, now, also, um, Austin, something you were telling me that's very interesting is you were mentioning that you also are Hebrew. Is that correct? Hebrew Israelite. Yeah, uh-huh. I'm. A, and really, I, what I, I tell people is to break it down in simpler terms: is uh, you know, Jesus believe in Jew. You know, I believe in the Messiah. I believe in. So many things, but I also believe in following the Torah as, as the Most High commanded us. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't believe that it's an exclusive offer. I believe that any and all can can follow the God's ways and be accepted into the kingdom. If, you know, you shut off your, just like anything, you know, you just got to turn a new leaf, so to speak. Mm-hmm. But um, I think a lot of Hebrew Israelites get a bad rap. And I, and I want to say like the government even put them on the terrorist list, um, and and that that's ridiculous because at the end of the day, we're we're no different than you know than, than the Jews, the Christians, or the Muslims. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we believe our in our Bible. We follow. We just walk in that way. And nothing in the Bible, because you you know, it's the same Bible as the Christian Bible, tells us to 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 harm anybody. Mm-hmm. So how, how did that? How would someone? Uh, assume that a Hebrew Israelite would be on a terrorist list. You're not an extremist group. That's correct. You know, I, I don't know. I, I feel like maybe it's the, some of the truths that the elite don't want to get out. But, you know, all this truth is right there in front of our face. We just weren't ready. Until you're ready to see it, you're not going to see it. You know, that's why God said, I'm going to give you line by line, word by word, precept on precept, until you get it. Amen. Amen. Now, how would one become a Hebrew uh, Israelite, um, Austin? What would, uh, for those people who are coming it's not, down, it's not, question? It's not like that. It's like, you know, read your Bible. Read your Bible. And when you come to the conclusion that you feel like you want to follow, uh, you know, the Torah. And the Torah meaning, you know, basically like like how the Jews do today. They follow the Passover, the, the high holy days that God told us to observe. And, and, you know, the, the dietary laws, uh, you know, we, we we don't do the sacrificial laws. And that's because the Torah told us not to, in a sense. He wow. told us that you won't accept our sacrifice. 
Mm-hmm. Once we get back to the new kingdom, then, you know, we can talk about it. Wow, that's some good stuff, man. That's some good stuff. It's kind of leading to a lot of comments um, as well. We really appreciate Austin sharing this information uh, as well. Austin, um, I have a question. I have a question that's come. Um, this is from Atlanta. This is from Sarah from Atlanta. She says, Austin, great smile. You look like Gilbert Arenas. Did anybody ever tell you like Gilbert Arenas? <laughs> I never heard that one. I appreciate that, though. Hey, you look smile and then- I don't know. I have to go look up Gilbert Arenas and see if that's a compliment. To yeah, that is. That is. That is. He's he's a great agent. Zero is great. You look a lot like okay. him. She said. But her question to you is: Name your top five greatest fighters. Top five greatest fighters. Um, I guess in no particular order: uh, Pernell Whitaker, Sugar Ray Robinson, Floyd Mayweather, Roy Jones Jr., and Sugar Ray Leonard. Uh oh. Beautiful. Now, um, I did not hear you mention Muhammad Ali. Is that because he was before your time? You know, it's not because he was before my time. Is but that's because he's the obvious choice. Now you said I you, know, give you got some names that that I feel were, you know, as important as Muhammad Ali in the boxing game. Now I appreciate I appreciate your question, Sarah. Now, um, Austin, um, you named some that I really like. First of all. Um, of course, Floyd is always going to be on that list. Um, it, what it kind of annoys me is people say that he's the greatest defensive fighter, but don't you have to throw punches to win? Absolutely. And, and you know, Floyd was a good defensive fighter, but, you know, there's, there's Willie Pep, who was a great defensive fighter. And, and like I just mentioned, Pernell Whitaker, who, in my opinion, was a better defensive fighter than Floyd Mayweather. And he threw them things. <laughs> <laughs> Um, now, you mentioned Sugar Ray Leonard as well, um, and you mentioned Sugar Ray Robinson. Now, Sugar Ray Robinson, many people deem as the greatest to ever do it. People, um, I don't know if you know this, but Sugar Ray Robinson went 123 and old before he lost his first fight. Can you think about this? 123 fights as a professional, and then you lose your first one. What are your thoughts on that, Austin? Man, that loss must have been traumatic. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, he must have been questioning everything after that loss but you know they don't make them like they used to and he probably fought you know two three times a week different weight classes well we know he was champion in different weight classes uh, you know they, that, that's definitely a different breed now austin for those um we have a young man um from chicago adam from chicago has a question for you he says austin i've been watching and, and you and looking at your career since you started in the amateurs in 2004 he said, we keep up what you're doing. His question is, what's next for Austin? What can we look forward to from Mr. Trout? Hey, Adam, I want to appreciate that continual support. Uh, what's next is I'm, I'm going to try and run at 147. I've, I've had my whole career at 54. And through, I, I just say, outside of, of camp discipline and, and just tighten up my diet, tighten up my consistency in working out, I've been able to make weight easier in my early 30s than I was in my late 20s. Mm-hmm. And so I, I just felt like if I stepped that up a little bit, I could get down to 147 and feel strong. And, you know, my last fight was 149. I'm confident I could get to 147 to keep my strength. Um, one of the reasons being is that everybody 154 is big as hell. These mm-hmm. cats, you know, when I fought her, that dude was easily 190 when he got into that ring. When I fought Jamal Charlo, that man, again, easily 190. And, you know, no no disrespect to them. If they coming down from 200 plus to 154 naturally and they're making it, that's 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 legal. So either I have to grow, which I can't do for real, or I have to see, think about coming down and shaking my hand at 147. And them cats are just as big as me. You know, Errol Spence, I, I've sized him up. You know, he, he's about as my size. So, you really? know, they can make that weight. I can make that way too. And I, I have, and I can. All right, very good. Um, we thank you for your question, Adam, in Chicago. Now we have, oh, good. This is a good one here. We have Mike. He's in uh, Miami, Florida. Mike is asking, can you explain to the audience what is a catch weight? Yeah, no problem. So, you know, we have the weight classes where, I was, as I was talking about, 154 or super welterweight, that's a weight class. Then you have welterweight, 147. Now, when you have a, a title fight, normally you usually title fight, title eliminate or whatnot, you have to come in right at 147 or, you know, a little bit under. But you, you cannot come anywhere over 147. 
So say you uh, wanted to do a catch weight for somebody who's bigger, you know, and wants to come down from 154 and I'm going to go up. So you say, let's meet in the middle, 150. You know, that's the catch weight. I'm going to give up three pounds. You're going to come down four pounds. Mm. We're going to meet in the middle at a catch weight. Mm-hmm. Now, um, why is it sometimes, is that in a catch weight, Austin? This is for me asking a question. Um, why is it like the guys make the weight and then all of a sudden the day of the fight, they're like 15 pounds heavier? What's that well, all about? I mean, first of all, that's that's part of the game. Uh, we get to weigh in about, you know, 24, 36 hours before the fight. Mm-hmm. Uh, so making the weight, you know, we're killing ourselves, we're drying out, you know, stop eating so that way we can get down low touch that weight and we rehydrate, replenish all that, that you know, the food that we want to eat and drink to, to feel as good as we can to have a great performance. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it's not uncommon to gain 20 pounds in that day. But when it becomes 30 or 40 pounds, you're like, oh, <laughs> wow. As you gain 40 pounds in one day, right? <laughs> wow, that is incredible. Class, you know that, I mean? that, that is incredible. Thanks for answering that for you. Got, could you have yeah. time for two more questions? Man, I got all the time that you know you need, man. Oh, I appreciate it. We have Jamie from Los Angeles. Jamie, is the question is, <laughs> her question is, uh, first of all, continue what you're doing. You're very inspirational to all of us African-Americans, Jamie said in your, in your boxing. Um, and his, her question to you is, was it difficult when you became successful in boxing, sleeping in silk underwear and having to get up and buy and train the next day? Yeah, it was. That's why I had to get rid of that silk draw. <laughs> <laughs> like I can't, you know, in, in Marvelous Hagler, he would say, you know, he, he lived his life very um, minimal because he would say things like that. Like, it's hard to get out this nice bed. He's still, you know, sheets at four in the morning to go run, like, I'm not going to do it. So uh, I've always tried to keep myself humble uh, before, I, you know, I felt like God was going to humble me. I would always try to humble myself and never get too too flashy, too lavish. Because, you know, when God decides to humble you, man, you don't want to come all the way down from ooh, here to there. Ooh, you know, come on, brother, you're preaching now. You're preaching. coasted up here, you know, live, live good enough but not lavish so to speak and you know it's 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 been a blessing itself oh wow that's that's awesome okay we got time for one more question ladies and gentlemen we really appreciate all of your questions i really oh, appreciate that yeah they, they're yeah. loving you man they're loving you all right so this is from cat she's from seattle she says uh okay she says are you married um <laughs> i am married yeah uh, oh there it is okay all right but her question is she said continue doing what you're doing an excellent fight her question is um you were winning the canelo fight why didn't you do a rematch you know i tried to get a rematch they definitely did not want to give me the rematch they 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 uh they knew they snuck by you know by the hair of their chin and chin chin so you know, the, the, you know the the golden rule is he who makes the goal makes the rules. And Canelo, he's the man right now. He does what he wants. If anybody watched that fight, and that is playing on your monitor, ladies and gentlemen, you see, I feel, and I may, and he, he may never admit it, but I believe that Floyd used your blueprint to beat Canelo when he fought him in okay. September of 2013. What do you think? In the first four rounds, that was Floyd's whole 12. And uh, I mean, you got to look at it as, as flattery. The greatest fighter of our time, he uh, used my blueprint That's against the greatest fighter of our time, right? Because Canelo right now, he's probably the greatest fighter of our time. Wow, that's great. So um, last thing, now this is a question for me. Um, a couple of things really quick. First of all, we're thoroughly enjoying Mr. Trout um, taking his time out on this Saturday mm-hmm. evening is to be on the Sherrard Show. When, when champions don't have to do this, ladies and gentlemen, but this man is humble and he's been doing great things in the industry um, of boxing and being an inspiration to others as well. So we really thank you for that. Austin, um, we have fans asking, where can we uh, keep tabs of you in terms of what you have going on and when you're going to have your next fight? Yes, follow me on my Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. It's all the same moniker, at No Doubt Trout. N-O-D-O-U-B-T-T-R-O-U-T. Ladies and gentlemen, you can see it on your monitor as well. And then, Austin, um, my question to you is for those young people who are sitting and watching this uh, interview is now, what advice would you give for the young upstart who wants to get to where you are as a boxer? 
always, you know, at the end of the day, you gotta perfect your craft. Every, you know, everything that comes with it, the, the marketing, the networking, you know, all that, that's good and all. And right now it's, it's kind of the time where um, Instagram could get you famous, but if you don't perfect your craft and keep working on your craft, um, all that can only go so far. You know, right. you got to fight. You're going to end up having to fight. And I don't, don't matter how many followers you got, how many views you got, if you ain't working on that part. That's when it becomes real. And all those followers, they will leave you in a second. <laughs> you don't Absolutely. You like that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Now, yeah. and that leads me to the thought, you know, um, you said in the beginning, you were saying that um, you don't play boxing. Not saying necessarily saying Nate Robinson was playing boxing, but what did you? What was your thoughts when um, you saw what happened uh, two weeks ago today? Yeah, he thought it was a fun little hobby he could pick up and jump in. And his opponent, I feel, has probably been taking it a lot more serious than he has. Uh, you know, not saying that this gets this kid's a real fighter. I don't think that at all. But I think he understands the magnitude of time that it's going to take to do this, and he's been doing that. So you know. Shout out to Nate Robinson for, for strapping his, his boots up and trying and getting in there. He does, he's done what a lot of people won't do. Uh, but you know, that that shows you that this is a serious game and and um you have to treat it as such. You know, Austin, I'll say this last thing, and people need to understand this, and I need you to uh back me up on this one. Um, people don't realize that, first of all, when you become a professional boxer, your hands are, are registered um weapons. Is that correct? That is correct. So if if a boxer swings on you and uh, knock you out, they can get charged for attempted murder because they are professionals. Now, the reason why I'm saying this is a deadly weapon. Yes, yes. Now, now my thing to this, Austin, is that um, what is it like the day of the fight when you're walking from the dressing room to the ring to meet your opponent? What is the feeling like heading to the ring? So that that feeling there is... is, uh, the most intense of the nerves, you know, like, I don't know how many boxes you talk to, but I can probably attest that we all are stupid nervous right before the fight, you know, and we might be sitting there putting on that mean face, like, oh, I'm ready to get him, but there's, there's a lot of uh, anxiety. There's excitement. You do, you, you want to get in there. You're ready to work on it. You know, you've been training, you're ready to, to perform and, Show these people that you can whoop this dude's butt. But then there's that fear because it only takes one shot. And, you know, you get get knocked out and, and really ultimately embarrassed in front of millions of people. Um, so it's just really a, it's a big mix of nerves that you have to kind of swallow and turn into energy. You know, that nervous energy helps you not get hit. You know, that excitement helps you go whoop his ass. And, and, and that fear makes sure that you don't get too, too brolic and get caught with nothing. So, you know, you got to make sure you can use all that uh, in the fight. And that's why I think everybody should learn some kind of boxing or, or just get some kind of physical altercation so that they can learn how to do that when it becomes the fight or flight moment. And, you know, who knows the way this world is shaping out, we may have a lot of fight or flight moments that we're not used to. It'd be great to, for people to, to practice. You know, one thing that's interesting Zab Judah had said and mentioned is that usually the guys that make the most noise know they can't fight. But usually when it comes to the boxers, they're the ones that don't, they don't try and be confrontational. He said if they're brutal in the ring, they're usually docile in person. Is that correct? <laughs> that's, man, my, my aunt Zab hit that on the money because really I'm very non-confrontational. You know, I'm like, nah, I don't, I don't want to go slow, man. Just leave it. Don't because, you know, when it, it comes to, to that, I don't, you know, we have to take it, but I don't want no problems. So that, that's true, true. I'm very non-confrontational. I mean, I know some fighters that are, you know, little bullies a little bit, but most most fighters that, that, that I know, you know, they, they just really pass it. You know, it's interesting. Mike Tyson said the same thing. He said, usually, he was speaking about Trevor Burbick, but he said, when you're a bully and you can fight, you usually don't live too long. <laughs> Yo, that is facts because you know they're gonna get rid of you. <laughs> Austin, any final words? Hey, no, I appreciate you having us all. Praise to the Most High Elohim. 
Uh, thank you for having me, Sherrod. Austin, it was an honor. It was such an honor, ladies and gentlemen. We really appreciate um, Austin stopping by on the Sherrod Show. Wish him the best of success. This is a real professional, not just in the ring, but also outside the ring as well. And ladies and gentlemen, on our next episode, speaking of boxing, Mike Tyson will be stopping by the Sherrod Show. We're so excited. In the meantime, Somebody enjoy said, the rest of your Saturday. Notre Dame lost, ladies and gentlemen. But we got to keep looking up. We'll see you next week on the Sherrod Show. Take care now.